Welcome to Friends of the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center Avalanche Fundamentals Lecture. Uh, my name is Shannon. I'm an education coordinator for the Friends of the Avalanche Center. Um, this lecture will cover uh, the intro to avalanches and avalanche terrain. Uh, just a reminder, this course is in partnership with the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center and MSU's Outdoor Rec program. All right, I think we'll dive on in. So what is this presentation gonna cover? So uh, this is uh, first of a four part series. Um, this presentation is gonna cover the introduction to avalanches, uh, go over terminology, uh, and cover the identification of avalanche terrain and consequences. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of visual examples and case studies as a jumping off point to learning. Um, there's a lot of things this presentation doesn't cover. Um, and hopefully in the series, you'll follow up with weather and snowpack, human factors and avalanche rescue. Uh, and this is also intended to be paired with our in-person field sessions. Um, so you'll have more information, you should have more information on that. Um, and yeah, this is not a comprehensive uh, or certification based course. This is just a starting off point, uh, but we're glad you're here. Uh, and so we'll dive right in. So why are we here? Most people tuning in probably enjoy recreating in the snow, um, whether that's lift access skiing, um, you know, backcountry ski touring or split boarding, snowmobiling. There's lots of different ways you can recreate in the winter time. Um, so that's probably why most of you all are here. Uh, and you're here to enjoy being outside in the winter uh, and also keep yourselves safe. So this class is just the start towards uh, learning about avalanche terrain and snowpack and weather, um, and also about decision-making skills and rescue skills for uh, when things don't go right. Um, but by taking this class, you're hopefully reducing your risk of getting caught in an avalanche when you go out and have fun in the mountains. Um, so yeah. Uh, like I said, this lecture will cover uh, mostly the intro to avalanches and terrain. Um, and you'll have to tune into the other three lectures to catch the rest of the material. Uh, and their best, this info is best complemented by our field course. Here's a picture of one of our field courses last season at Bridger Bowl. Um, most of us out recreating aren't looking to spend all day in a pit um, or you know, examining the snowpack, we're really out to get turns like this. Uh, and so we wanna keep this info really relevant and in context to what most people are out in the backcountry wanting to do, which is have a good time. Um, but the reality is that avalanches can be really dangerous. And a lot of the places we like recreating are avalanche terrain. We're gonna cover a lot more about that in this talk. So bottom line, avalanches are the number one cause of death on national forest land in the winter. Uh, annually, there's typically 25 to 30 deaths due to avalanches in the United States a year. Um, and if you're recreating in the winter, you need to know about avalanches. So that covers from, um, like I said, people who are just riding lifts at the ski area to people who are already out in the back country, whether it's uh, skiing, Splitboarding or snowmobiling. Um, also, ice climbers, people Nordic skiing, hiking. If you're if you're getting out there in the winter, you need to know about avalanches. So we're glad you're here. So we're going to jump right in. What is an avalanche? Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different types of avalanches, um, but the essential definition of an avalanche is snow that is moving down a mountain. Um, and we have four main types. So we have a uh, differentiation between loose snow avalanches and slab avalanches. We also have wet avalanches and dry avalanches. I'm gonna walk you through examples of each different type. 
So here we have a dry loose snow avalanche. Um, these are commonly referred to as sloughs. Uh, and essentially the snow loses cohesion with uh, the snow around it and runs down the hill, dribbles down the hill. Uh, these can be dangerous if they knock you off your feet. Um, and they're generally triggered from underfoot or under your sled. Next, we have wet loose snow avalanches. Uh, and these are commonly referred to as point release avalanches. On the picture, you can see uh, how they start at one point and then fan out. These can entrain a lot of snow and mass, including dirt and rocks. Um, they typically move slower, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not dangerous. These will also knock you off your feet and can drag you into a place you don't want to be. So they're worth being aware of. Uh, we commonly see these in the springtime or on solar aspects. We'll talk more about that uh, as well. Next, we have our wet slab avalanches. And the main difference between slab avalanches and loose avalanches is that slab avalanches have a cohesive slab. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot more about that as well. So this picture is a large wet slab avalanche. Uh, wet slabs can break over really large zones. This is a very big avalanche. Uh, we don't see wet slab avalanches uh, very often midwinter. Um, they're certainly more, you're more likely to see them when it's either raining or you've had a rapid melt or increase in temperature. So dry slabs are the type of avalanche we're the most concerned with. So dry slab avalanches can be particularly dangerous um, because of the amount of snow that they can involve uh, and how they shatter across the slope and gain speed really rapidly. So reminder, these are our primary concern as backcountry recreators due to the mechanics of how they release. And we're gonna talk more about that right now. So I have a couple of videos showing what dry slab avalanches look like. Uh, these are all triggered by folks recreating um, and here's the first one. So this is a snowmobiler. The avalanche is triggered at the top of the slope and you can just see how fast this accelerates. Here we have our sledder who's released an airbag and is riding downhill. You can see how fast they were separated from their sled. Um, and that's just to show how wide these avalanches can break and how quickly they can move. Like that was just a couple seconds and they're transported down the hill away from their machine. And here's a snowboarder being caught in an avalanche from a different point of view. So this video is to demonstrate just how fast and chaotic being caught in an avalanche is. These can be really violent events. So here the avalanche breaks and they're not, the snowboarders knocked off their feet and you can just see how fast they're moving, just a complete lock, last, lack of control, um, really scary. So uh, we're gonna go over kind of the mechanics of what's happening in a slab avalanche with Pokey and Gumby. So we just saw in those two videos why slab avalanches can be so dangerous, um, but let's dig a little deeper, see what's going on. So Pokey and Gumby out for a ride, uh, end up wanting to walk across this slope, it's 39 degrees. They end up triggering an avalanche. So essentially the cohesive snow at the top of the snowpack uh, where they are is collapsed onto a weak layer. The slope collapses and begins to shatter around them, um, propagating. So when you think of, of a a crack in the slope, just be continuing to shatter uh, or move across the slope. That's what that term propagating means. So we have this avalanche propagate around them. Um, Gumby and Pokey, as this avalanche begins to move down the hill, as the snow mass moves down the hill, they're knocked off their feet. And now the slab is going to accelerate. So this avalanche is accelerating. Um, avalanches can accelerate to speeds upwards 80 miles per hour. Uh, so really fast acceleration, getting hurled downhill with thousands of pounds of snow. Um, pretty dangerous scenario Pokey and Gumby have found themselves in. 
And then uh, as this avalanche decelerates in lower angle terrain, the snow is gonna harden around them. It's gonna feel like uh, that big snow plow pile in the parking lot, like cement. Uh, leaving Gumby and Pokey in need of a rescue after taking this ride. They cannot get themselves out of the avalanche debris by themselves. And luckily they had trained backcountry partners with them. So making a full recovery, currently taking a vacation to get ready for this winter season. So uh, that kind of broke down the mechanics a little bit, uh, but let's talk about the recipe for a slab avalanche. We need to have a couple things. Uh, we need to have a slab, weak layer, and we're gonna talk more about that during the snowpack and weather section, uh, but we're just kind of identifying these terms here today. Uh, and then we also need to have a slope. Uh, and that's mostly what this lecture is about. We're gonna talk about avalanche terrain a lot more in depth. So we need to have a slope steep enough to have the snow slide downhill. Um, we can have poor snow structure and not avalanches if we're on terrain that is low angle and not corrected, connected to steep terrain. Um, but the kind of final thing we need for avalanches is some variety of trigger that can be humans, could be an animal. Uh, there are even natural triggers, just like increase in snow load or a wind event or rain. Um, but we're mostly concerned with those human triggers. So us being the trigger and potentially being caught in an avalanche. Here's a quick video. We can watch this person skinning, uh, avalanche initiates, get a really good idea for all the components there. Uh, and it's worth noting that this person was not on the slope that was steep enough to avalanche. They were adjacent to it on a lower angle part of the slope, uh, but they still were the trigger of the avalanche. All right, couple more terms. So um, we just want to develop common language that you'll hear repeatedly throughout these lectures and during your course. Uh, so these are kind of the components of an avalanche. We have the starting zone, and that's where the avalanche is actually initiating from. Um, that's the terrain that's steep enough to produce avalanches. Then we have the track. That's the distance uh, that the avalanche runs until it arrests or stops on itself. Uh, and that's gonna be down in the bottom in the runout zone. We have a couple terms for this. It could be runout zone, deposition zone, debris. Um, you'll hear those kind of all interchangeably. Here's just another example to go through those terms again. We have the starting zone uh, kind of at the top by that green arrow. Uh, we have our track and we have our runout zone. Uh, and I put this slide in to, just to demonstrate a different looking avalanche. The, the previous avalanche was on kind of a big open slope. This avalanche is, has been channeled into a gully. Uh, so you could anticipate the debris at the bottom might be, might be a little bit deeper because it's been channeled in a pretty narrow track rather than fanning out. So just a different, different type of avalanche uh, path here. So a couple more terms to add to to our tool belt. Um, here we have two pictures, one of a point release avalanche. Remember those are our loose snow avalanches. And then we have our slab avalanche. Uh, and so remember we have uh, at the top, we have our starting zone. That's where the avalanche actually is occurring. Um, and at the very top is the crown. So easy to remember, crown's what's on the top of your head uh, if you're royalty. So. Slab avalanche, crowns at the top. Uh, the snow above the crown likely didn't release uh, because of either the specific snowpack conditions or the slope angle. Um, same, same with what's on either side of the avalanche. So here you can see those sides are called flanks. Uh, and for whatever reason, the snow on either side or above the crown didn't release. Um, but if they are in terrain st steep enough to produce avalanches, uh, you could still get an avalanche adjacent to this avalanche. So just worth pointing out. Um, other terms that are new on this slide, we have our bed surface. Uh, so that's the surface that the avalanche runs on. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, that runout zone or deposition zone, debris at the bottom. And then we have this thing called a stock wall at the very bottom. 
Uh, and that's essentially where the avalanche uh, arrests on itself and, and begins to stop forming that, that deposition zone. Um, so if you were to take a ride in this avalanche and ended up all the way at the bottom, you would end up uh, in that deposition zone. All right, let's recap what we've covered. So avalanches can be deadly, uh, but they also can occur in places we wanna recreate in. So slab avalanches require a couple things. You need to have a slab, a weak layer, slope, and a trigger. We're gonna emphasize a lot more about the slope and trigger component in this talk. Uh, and avalanches are formed by the interplay of snowpack, weather, and terrain. And then this is a really important point. Uh, avalanche problem is essentially a human one. So if we did not want to be in the type of terrain where avalanches can happen, it would not be an issue for us to be uh, learning about or, or funding research in or having avalanche forecast centers. So um, the avalanche problem is a problem because we want to be involved in places that avalanches can occur. So uh, as we jump into our discussion of terrain, I wanted to show the avalanche triangle, just kind of, of the interconnectedness of all these components. So we're really going to hone in on terrain. Uh, and I think one of the one of the things that I always like to think about uh, with, with avalanches uh, is that ultimately I, as a recreational user, can control my exposure to terrain. I can't control uh, what the weather's like, I can't control the way that the snowpack is, um, but I certainly can control where I choose to put myself, where I choose to go skiing or riding. And I think that's a really important take home. So terrain, we're asking ourselves a couple important questions. Is this terrain capable of producing an avalanche? How do we know that? Uh, I think that this is a really knowable question. Like we can find the answer to, is this avalanche terrain? So what would happen if there was an avalanche here? And then what, what are we gonna do about it? Uh, so this is also a really important point um, is that we hope to give you all tools to actually go out and make good choices for yourself. I think that's the most important thing when we consider our exposure to avalanche terrain is that we have a lot of choice in, uh, in what we're going out there and doing. All right, terrain. Avalanche terrain comes in a lot of different sizes. We have this big in your face avalanche terrain uh, in the center of the screen, Crown Butte outside of Cook City. Uh, this is, I, th I think many people could uh, establish this as avalanche terrain even without the large avalanche in the picture, but this is the site of a fatal avalanche. Um, and this, this particular instance, uh, it turned into an extended rescue due to uh, the victim not having an avalanche beacon turned on. Um, but very big in your face terrain, uh, kind of obvious avalanche terrain. There's no trees in the, the whole bowl. Um, yeah, big steep terrain. Uh, the pictures on the sides are maybe a little less obvious terrain. And that's terrain we wanna look out for as well. So terrain that is steep enough to avalanche, uh, but maybe isn't like jumping in our faces about it being steep or scary or extreme. Um, the picture on the left is in the is a snow biker triggered avalanche in the Madison, and you can see all the trees below the avalanche and the snow biker in the image. And then the picture on the right is out by the Garnet Lookout Tower. Uh, that would also be oh, that's in the Gallatin, um, just off uh, Highway 191. So, like I said, avalanche train comes in a lot of different sizes. This avalanche uh, up in Alaska looks uh, not, not very similar to a lot of avalanches we'd find in Southwest Montana. It's quite large. Uh, this crown is easily 20 feet tall. Um, and this is not the type of avalanche you'd see every day uh, or really much at all in Southwest Montana. It's incredibly large. Um, but uh, just to show the, the scale here uh, and then we can have really small avalanches too. Here's our, our Gumby sized avalanche from earlier, uh, pokey up at the, or Gumby up at the crown, checking things out, um, small avalanche. 
we're essentially concerned with avalanches large enough to hurt, bury, or kill us. Uh, this avalanche buried and killed someone. Uh, it is about 100 to 200 vertical feet uh, and 300 feet horizontally. So not, not the biggest avalanche, certainly not as big as that giant Alaska avalanche, um, but in terrain large enough uh, to fully bury someone. So this avalanche fully buried someone. They also didn't have uh, any rescue gear on them. So it ended up taking uh, over an hour to locate them. Um, here's just a zoomed in picture. Uh, note that this is a rescuer for scale. So really this terrain is not like big or in your face, but it is steep enough to avalanche and had enough mass that it could bury someone. Um, so this is, you know, avalanche train that can kill you. So let's go back and look at it before I move on. Um, but yeah, the, the main point is like avalanche terrain can come in lots of different sizes. And as recreationalists, we just need to be able to identify a terrain that can pose uh, bad consequences to us. All right, here's a piece of local terrain. Um, this is Saddle Peak just south of Bridger Bowl. Uh, and just pointing out the spot that the next picture is gonna be in here with these arrows, but uh, this is big avalanche terrain and it's consequential avalanche terrain. Um, and why I say that is the large cliffs uh, underneath the, the yellow arrows. So if you were to go for a ride here, you'd go over these cliffs. This terrain's also really easy to access. This is terrain that probably many of us uh, have been on and is quite fun to be on. So same, same piece of terrain from a different perspective. This is great skiing, um, really fun skiing. Most advanced skiers or riders would agree that this is the type of terrain they want to be in. Um, but this terrain is above those cliffs. So it is not only avalanche terrain, but avalanche terrain that could really, really hurt you. So here's kind of another zooming back out. And we just wanna ask ourselves, what's the worst thing that could happen here? So here's a couple pictures of large avalanches uh, and just focusing back to where um, that previous image was. So the really good skiing in this picture has been taken out by a large avalanche. Uh, this avalanche is easily um, a quarter to half a mile in size, very big avalanche. Here's another large avalanche on Saddle Peak. Um, this one, a little bit smaller than the last image, uh, but would still impact the area where that good skiing was. So the bottom line, large avalanches like this aren't possible every day, uh, but we can notice patterns uh, and forecasted patterns uh, and not put ourselves in this type of terrain when it's inappropriate to be there. Uh, like you would, you, you do not want to be on Saddle Peak on a day like when this avalanche happened. Uh, luckily, no one was caught or killed in this avalanche, uh, but someone easily could have been. Uh, there were many people on the slope that day, uh, and this is big terrain. So um, bringing it back to kind of what do we do about it? We have some choices. We could avoid the terrain, the terrain that has all the fun skiing and riding, uh, or a lot of it. We could learn about avalanches and minimize our risks. That's what hopefully we're, we're all doing here is we are interested in minimizing our risk. Uh, that doesn't mean eliminating it by going out and engaging in, um, in the back country and in avalanche train, there's always gonna be some risk. Or you can roll the dice, pull the lever. Uh, not a very good long-term strategy uh, much like with this slot machine, most of the time you're going to pull it and you're not going not gonna to win. Um, but with avalanches, uh, most of the time you're going to engage in avalanche train and nothing's going to happen. Uh, but that doesn't mean that one day you can't be caught in an avalanche. Uh, and so you're going out and taking chances and hopefully you're uh, educated, informed and, and making decisions based on um, training and information. And yeah, I bring, I bring up that slide. Uh, we're not trying to convince people not to ski or ride an avalanche train. Uh, our hope is to 
just give you information to make good decisions for yourself. So we wanna be able to recognize avalanche terrain. Uh, we're gonna go over all of these factors. The most important um, being kind of slope angle and consequence. But we're also gonna cover uh, slope size and shape, vegetation and ground cover, run out, aspect and elevation. So we got a lot of stuff to cover, uh, we'll jump in. Slope angle, uh, this one's big. So the majority of avalanches are occurring in 30 to 45 degree steepness terrain. Um, why we don't see avalanches as frequently below 30 degrees is it's just not steep enough to get the snow moving. Like I mentioned, you can have uh, an unstable snowpack in lower angle terrain. Uh, and if you're not connected to steeper terrain, you're just not gonna see avalanches there very, very frequently. There's some kind of rare exceptions to that where we could be seeing avalanches in lower degree terrain, but uh, the majority of the time we're seeing them in 30 to 45 degrees. We're not seeing them steeper than 45 degrees as frequently, um, just because you end up seeing a lot of loose avalanches in steeper terrain, less likely to build up slabs. Um, but if you're in 45 degree terrain, you gotta pass back through the avalanche terrain zone to get back to flat. So um, just something to consider is that uh, if we're in terrain above 30 degrees, we're exposing ourselves to avalanche terrain. So here's an uh, example slope. We have here our terrain that is most likely avalanche starting zone. Uh, and the kind of prime number is the majority of slab avalanches are happening closest to 39 degrees uh, with that range of 30 to 45 degrees. But we also wanna be concerned about this terrain that's adjacent to, uh, below and connected to that steeper terrain, the prime time terrain. Um, and this is called connected terrain or terrain with overhead hazard. So we wanna be aware of that type of terrain too uh, and not be exposing ourselves to likely avalanche starting zones above us. So here's a nice um, mellow powder field. Just give you an idea of what these slope angles look like. This 25, 27, great place to take your dog for a walk. Uh, here we have a 30 degree slope kind of off to the side. Uh, generally speaking, the character of this slope is lower angle below 30 degrees. Um, this is decidedly not terrain you're gonna see avalanches in. Um, it's just not steep enough. Uh, here we have a little bit steeper terrain. This is 37 degrees. That's right, kind of creeping towards the prime time avalanche terrain. Uh, and it's worth noting that for most people who ski or snowboard or snowmobile, this is like advanced terrain. This is the type of terrain people want to be in. This is where the fun happens. Uh, and so even if this picture doesn't look that steep, it has it was measured at 37 degrees. And so it's good to just adjust your kind of internal inclinometer, if you will, based on, on the degrees. So here we have uh, a lot of different terrain um, where the snowmobiler is parked is relatively flat. Um, we have kind of steeper mountains in the back and rolling hills in the foreground. So this is a site of a fatality. Uh, the crown with the red arrow points to uh, where the avalanche uh, initiated. And the slope angle there is 36 to 40 degrees. And in this picture, it's really hard to imagine it being that steep because the terrain honestly doesn't, doesn't look intimidating. Uh, but that's the point is that avalanche terrain is not just extreme terrain. It is terrain steeper than 30 degrees. So how do we know if we're in avalanche terrain or not? We use tools, uh, mostly in clinometers. Uh, most phones have inclinometers on them these days, or you can have a plastic one. Um, this, this course, the field component uh, comes with an inclinometer. So hopefully you'll get lots of practice using one. Um, but an inclinometer is only as good as your ability to use it and to um, make, make judgments about terrain without putting yourself in the terrain. So we don't wanna be putting ourselves in avalanche terrain um, unintentionally. Uh, we wanna know using our ability to uh, 
uh, guess or estimate slope steepness, and then context clues and some common sense. Uh, we don't, yeah, we don't want to be putting ourselves in avalanche terrain unknowingly. So there's a lot of other tools out there. Uh, this, what I have pulled up on my screen is a pretty common tool. Um, folks use uh, maps like this all the time. Uh, this one is, is, I just looked up Bridger Bowl ski area and slapped a slope angle shading overlay on it. Uh, and this can tell me that uh, there are places that are steeper than other places. So for those of you familiar with Bridger, um, the pin on the lower right part of the screen is right at the, the lodge at Sunnyside Lift. Uh, and then the upper pins are at uh, the Alpine Lift and Bradley's Meadow. And we can see uh, this ridgeline terrain that's all blue. Uh, that's 45 degrees plus. And then our terrain that's orange or darker uh, is 30 or up. So this can give you a really good sense of like, okay, there is avalanche terrain in these areas, uh, but it's worth noting that these mapping applications are a great tool, but are not the only tool. Um, you need to field check your slope angles, uh, use context clues, and know whether or not you're in an avalanche terrain. Don't just rely on, on a map with some colors. Um, and more than that, Use your discretion, read about the data you're using and learn how to use the product as it's intended. All right, so we've talked a bit about slope angle and how to identify avalanche terrain. Um, now we're gonna talk about a uh, consequence of terrain. So there are some places where getting caught in an avalanche would be worse than others. Um, and these are called terrain traps. Their terrain traps are any part of the terrain that amplifies the consequence. So trees, if you have uh, an avalanche starting zone with trees below it, um, you will just be run through the trees going, you know, 60 plus miles an hour. Um, and they will produce a lot of traumatic injuries if you're run through trees going that fast. So uh, another terrain trap would be large avalanche paths. Large paths equals big avalanches. Um, another would be, gullies, creek beds, sharp transitions, benches, anything, any, any place where snow can pile up uh, and make avalanche burial deeper. So even small pieces of avalanche terrain that have features like this below them can be really hazardous. We end up seeing fatalities every year of someone being buried deeply in a terrain trap like a gully or on a road. Uh, the last one on this slide is cliffs or rocks. Um, and we have uh, an example of, of an avalanche uh, on the fin outside of Cook City. And this avalanche uh, caught several people in it last year and they were run over uh, this area with trees and cliffs below the starting zone. And so um, similar to trees getting Getting dragged over cliffs and, and into rocks is a really good way to have traumatic injuries and is not going to produce a good outcome. So here's another example uh, of just terrain that can produce really bad consequences. So uh, this is from an accident last season in Utah uh, and this kind of open bowl terrain with dense trees under it. Uh, this avalanche caught several people, um, buried several people, and the burials were quite deep. Uh, and it was a really, really tragic accident in, in terrain that uh, can be really harmful. So it's just worth being aware of the consequences of terrain. I think especially with trees in, in Southwest Montana, the majority of Avalanche, avalanche runout zones and slide paths end in trees. And so it's it's worth asking yourself, um, looking at terrain, what, what could happen to me here? So here's just a picture of, um, you know, easily 40 to 50 year old trees that are snapped in half. Uh, also to note on this slide, as you can see what's called flagging in these trees, the uphill side of the tree doesn't have branches on it anymore. So that's a really good indicator of avalanche runout or avalanche terrain. All right, in this slide, really straightforward, uh, just demystifying the um, narrative or the myth that uh, trees are generally safer terrain. 
Uh, if trees are spaced out enough to ski through, they are not anchoring a slope. If you are an avalanche terrain and there are trees, that is a terrain trap. All right. Uh, next, we're going to talk about slope shape. So we have two main shapes, convexity and concavity. We're most concerned about uh, convexities or rollovers uh, as areas where avalanches are likely to initiate uh, just due to the tension in the snow. So concavities can also be places where avalanche debris piles up. I have this uh, image as an example of an area where an avalanche started on kind of a rollover and then uh, deposited debris into a gully uh, terrain trap, producing a really deep burial. All right, this video is just giving an idea of uh, extent of a slide path uh, and visual clues to, to look at when you're entering terrain about where a slide path has run previously. This is an avalanche that was recorded and submitted as an observation to the GNFAC last season up in Flanders in Highlight Canyon. So here we have skier skiing down. Skiing looks awesome. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the image, there is a skin track and there's also no trees down there. And so when you're entering terrain, being a detective and asking yourself, why aren't there trees here? Um, is, this, is this avalanche terrain I'm in? Uh, and you can see this avalanche running into that flat zone at the bottom, the bowl over the skin track. And this avalanche was quite large, ended up wrapping around the corner, you can't see in the video. Uh, and yeah, just gives a bit of perspective. I have an image from the bottom of the slide path on my next slide. We can get there. Cool. There we go. All right. Uh, here's a different perspective on on that avalanche. Uh, we want to just be looking for context clues about the extent of terrain, especially when we're traveling uphill. We want to expose ourselves to avalanche terrain uh, as little as possible while skiing or sportboarding. And so what we're looking for is areas that don't have trees or have small trees uh, versus areas that have large mature trees. We're looking for flagging, uh, like I, I showed in the, the slide a couple images ago, um, or we could be looking for different types of trees or vegetation. So we're really out there, like I said, as detectives looking for clues about what type of terrain this is. Uh, so even if we couldn't see an avalanche on this terrain, we're, give, we're given a lot of clues that this is avalanche terrain. Um, and the actionable thing to take away from this is give terrain space. So give avalanche terrain plenty of room if you don't want to be in it. Um, make sure that we're setting uphill tracks if we're skinning well away from avalanche paths. Uh, and if we're, if we're sledding, make sure we're not regrouping in avalanche paths. Um, and just using those context clues to make good decisions. All right, like I said, we're detectives. So in this image, we're, we're curious. Why isn't there snow where the red circle is? Why is there an avalanche over here? So one, we can identify that this is avalanche terrain. Uh, two, we're also seeing a pattern. So. There isn't snow here because wind transported it away. So that could give us an indication of the generalized wind direction. So we're talking about slope aspect, so the aspect with respect to wind. We have a wind direction, and we have a windward aspect and a leeward aspect. So this leeward is wind loaded, windward is wind scoured. So we're just looking for generalized pattern and uh, in the Western United States, a generalized pattern is that wind blows from the West off the Pacific Ocean uh, and produces weather that's linked to, uh, yeah, linked to jet stream off the ocean. Uh, so Bridger Ridge here, uh, we have a generalized pattern of wind going from the West to the East. What that produces on our East facing aspects is cornices, wind pillows, uh, and wind loading. 
It also produces better skiing because that's where the snow is. So there's a reason Bridger Bowl is on the east side of the range and um, not on, you know, you can even see it in this picture, the scoured slope right under, right under the word Bridger, there's just rocks. Um, skiing, the skiing and riding isn't good where there's only rocks, we need snow. So just being curious about these patterns we see. The next aspect is with respect to the sun. So we're talking about our, our cardinal aspects here. Generally speaking, these shady aspects in the Northern hemisphere are northerly, uh, so facing north. We're gonna expect them to be cooler, not have as much sun exposure during the winter. Uh, and perhaps those will have um, more persistent instabilities. I think we'll talk more about that in the snow, uh, snowpack and weather lecture. Then on our solar aspects, our southerly aspects, uh, we're gonna anticipate warmer temps, uh, maybe crust, shallower snowpack, uh, and maybe wet loose avalanches during warming events. Here's an example of that solar effect. This is a south aspect, uh, just south of Big Sky off of 191, pretty close to uh, Sage Creek Taylor Fork area. Uh, and you can see the point release avalanches and also a really shallow snowpack. So this is definitely a pattern. Uh, and then another pattern we end up seeing is on non-solar aspects. Uh, so northerly aspects up high. These are great places for ice climbing uh, in the fall. So October, November, and December. Um, but we also see the snowpack get built up more there early season. And this is an image of a shooting crack on the Sphinx Mountain. Um, so this is just another generalized pattern that we end up seeing. Elevation. So uh, the major point with elevation is we have ranges that cover broad bands of elevation uh, and higher elevations, you end up seeing um, colder, more snow, maybe more wind. You, like, you wouldn't anticipate the conditions at the base of Bridger Bowl to be the same as at the ridge or um, especially when you have more kind of extreme elevation difference, like in the Madison range, uh, the top of Lone Peak's over 11,000 feet. You wouldn't anticipate the conditions at the top of Lone Peak to be similar to, you know, Big Sky Town Center, uh, just because the elevation is so different. You're going to have much harsher, more extreme temperatures up higher. All right. So I've thrown a lot of information at you, and now it's time to, to consider putting it all together. Um, essentially, we want to go out there and investigate and look for patterns uh, that help us make choices more easily. So looking at this image, we see a pattern of maybe there's some wind loading. Uh, we can see that kind of cornice along the ridge uh, just above the circle I drew in. And then we can see old avalanches. So um, on similar aspects, and that's, that's something that ends up happening. We end up seeing um, a pattern of, of aspect for avalanches. Uh, and we, what we're really going out here to do is to have a good time recreating. And it's easier if we can make simple choices by looking at, at patterns. So like I said, we wanna keep it simple. Um, most folks aren't going for their, their PhD in snow science out here. Uh, we're really just trying to have a good time. So. We have a lot of things to think about, but we have some really simple kind of uh, travel protocol that help us reduce our risk. So one of those would be uh, when we see avalanches, that's a really good indicator that we shouldn't be in avalanche terrain adjacent to those avalanches. Nope. Yep, avoid avalanche terrain adjacent to recent avalanches. Uh, avoid terrain with observed signs of instability. And obvious, we're looking for obvious signs. It's not rocket science. We are looking for recent avalanches, um, shooting cracks, collapsing, whooping, um, forecasted avalanche problems, and observed recent avalanches on similar terrain. Big picture patterns. Next, as we're traveling through terrain, we can get lost in the complexity. So. This is terrain outside of Cook City. Um, we see lots of big avalanche terrain, but our job when we're out here is to just reduce our exposure to big avalanche terrain with big consequences if we don't wanna be in it. So I see this big terrain in this slide, but I also see a lot of small terrain uh, that could also 
the dangerous avalanche terrain. So we just want to limit our exposure to, to avalanche terrain, uh, travel through terrain in such a way that uh, we're not putting ourselves uh, at you know, unnecessary risk, but still having fun and meeting our goals. So another travel protocol that'll go a long way is to travel one at a time. So here's Crown Butte. Uh, I had it earlier on a slide with a very large avalanche on it. Uh, but here we have four people on a slide path at once. Uh, and the bottom line is if you're not in avalanche terrain, um, one at a time and there's an avalanche, who's gonna perform the rescue? Uh, we'll go over that more in the, the rescue uh, presentation, but it's a really simple thing you can do to set yourself up for better outcomes. Is if you're gonna be engaging in avalanche terrain, make sure that people are capable of, of rescuing you uh, and that you're sticking to slopes one at a time. Um, especially with, with sleds, like people can get really spread out, but you want to make sure you have a communication plan and that you're capable of performing rescue if you're going to be in avalanche terrain. Kind of a bottom line is that uh, we want to set ourselves up to be able to rescue people if we're in avalanche terrain. All right, that kind of recaps the uh, discussion on terrain. And so we still know a lot of the same thing, that av avalanches can be really deadly, um, but there's a lot of things we can do to reduce our risk. So slab avalanches, uh, they require a couple things and we really hammered in like terrain. To have avalanches, you need to have terrain capable of producing avalanches. Uh, and to have avalanches that impact humans, humans have to be in that terrain. So uh, as, folks recreating, we wanna just be aware of our exposure to avalanche terrain and, and develop the tools to know if we're in avalanche terrain and how to reduce our exposure. We don't wanna be in that terrain. And then avalanches are formed by the interplay of snowpack, weather, and terrain. Just kind of hammering that, that home again. Um, so I think in some ways, uh, terrain is something that just takes a lot of experience on the ground, getting familiar with terrain, and that's where taking a field component of the course is really useful to just get, get out there, get to see terrain, get to see terrain from other people's perspective, um, especially more experienced uh, recreators and professionals' perspectives. Um, because thinking back to that avalanche triangle, terrain is the one component we can control. So what's next? Uh, you have three more presentations. We have a live Q&A. And we have our field session uh, with our awesome instructor team, either at Bridger or at Buck Ridge. Um, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, and just wanted to give a quick plug uh, to thank our partners for this program and to thank you for tuning in. All right, have a great winter.